Welcome to Sean's Vision Studios. Welcome to the Great and New Bedford Regional Vocational Technical High School 9th Annual Induction Hall of Fame. Chester Barroki. Mike Gomes. Ray Richard. Adalbert Rosario. Barbara Stevens.
good to day with. All the students, they have that smile perpetually on their face. Dana Warrington. Names that are on the list, and hopefully every year we get more and more. 
At this time, I'd like to show members here what gifts they'll be receiving tonight. Many of you had the opportunity to see them on your way in. Some people I know came in the main doors were unable to. So again, let me just explain a few things we have. The first gift, which is a laminated ticket for tonight's induction banquet, on the back of it is a lifetime pass to all Oak Tech home athletic events. So anybody out here, will hopefully will support our teams in the future. <laughs> there are placemats that you have at your table. There are many more placemats outside that area of the table. Please help yourselves to take them. The members up here will receive four of the placemats laminated by a graphic arts department for souvenirs. Again, there are also there are some posters that were around uh, talking about tonight's Hall of Fame induction banquet. The inductees are on them, and the members that they have, again, they receive one of these in each of their boxes. On the way in, we saw the trophy case, the portable trophy case that we had. The plaques that you see in there are going to be permanently placed in our trophy case at the um, athletic center, the field house at school. So those are going back to the school, but what we do have here, and this is Jeff off what you hear, is that we do have a high school picture with a nice frame for the memories. One of the gifts that we started many years ago, and I think one of my favorites, is the baseball cards. Now, each member here will receive 25 cards for themselves, and it has their picture on it, the induction date, uh, date, also a memory of theirs and all their accomplishments they received. They will also receive a baseball card of every other inductee with them tonight. The next item that they'll receive is a V-neck white sweater. It has a Hulk Hall of Fame. It has a V, the green, with the gold surrounding on the outside. Uh, and if their sizes don't fit, please let me know. I'll take care of it later. <laughs> All right, the other gift, the last gift we have, which again, I think most of the inductees treasure, it's a watch, and on the watch it has the V with the Hall of Fame on it. It's a special guy in that we have the copyright on in our school, and only people that are inducted into the Hall of Fame can purchase these watches. So this is a memento, hopefully they'll treasure forever, and again, the watch is theirs. Thank you. As I mentioned about the placemats, there are also the program booklets. Uh, there are many more out there. Again, anybody here is welcome to them. So please help yourself afterwards. Uh, the nomination forms are out there. Please, the only way we get names or research is for people like you to submit them into us. So I look forward to that. Again, thank you for being here tonight, and I hope to see many of you next year at our 10th induction. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Mike. For all of you Hall of Famers that are present tonight, if you'd like to meet with Jimmy Souza afterwards, he'll give you the going rate of the uh, worth of your baseball cards at the latest shows. So you can check with Jimmy afterwards. Before we get into the induction of tonight's uh, Hall of Famers, those who are to be inducted, I'd like to have all of those who are present that are already in, and I know there are an awful lot of you here. Please stand to be recognized. All of you who are already in the New Mexico Tech Hall of Fame, wave your hands and stand. And before we get into the induction of the honorees tonight, we still have another honor to bestow. And uh, this gentleman I know very well. He and I started at this institution, broadcaster, doing us the games along with our other schedules that we did way back in 1978, 77-78. But uh, to tell you more about him, the uh, man who uh, has uh, going to receive the dedication honors tonight, I call back the chairman of the Hall of Fame committee, committee Mike Shea. Mike, would you? Thank you. 
Ray for asking me to speak on his behalf. Ray and I came together around the same year. Ray's first year as equipment manager is my first year as head coach of the football team at Oak Tech. It didn't take long to realize that Ray took his job just as serious as I took mine. I can remember coming home my first year coaching in the double sessions, a little sore, a little tired, you know, a little cranky, you know, just a little upset that the team is not as good as I thought. And as soon as I get home, the phone would ring. And on the other line, it's, uh, hi, Mike, this is Ray. Um, the locker room was uh, left with like five towels, two pairs of shoes, and uh, some shots. Okay, Ray, thank you. <laughs> now, the next day I get home, I see the same, you know, same phone call. I get home, and again, just a little upset, a little tired. My side quarterback went down with a hamstring. I started running back, running back, didn't show up because he had to babysit at home. You know, all the major concerns of head coach, and the phone would ring. I might, this is right. Right, uh, there's some towels, there was some equipment left on the floor here. Okay, all right, thank you. You know, I was, I was looking for that phone call that would tell me that I would have a six foot five, 285 pound transfer coming in from Texas. And then here I am looking at what, what's happening. But as a coach, I was teaching my players about discipline on the field. To be on time, have straight lines, look sharp in cows, work hard, do the best you can. It didn't take me long to realize that I wasn't getting any more phone calls from Ray because Ray was doing the exact same thing off the field that I was doing on the field. We were working together. We had a common goal to reach and, and, and within a short period of time, we were both doing it. And I was checking the locker rooms more and the locker room was being left clean. And what was happening was that these people were getting the discipline already even before they went on the field. Ray was doing something that I, I, I respected. Ray was disciplining the athletes. And, it, and this time here with the equipment, with my other coaches, the friendship and respect for each other began. Again, we were working together, taking 14, 15, 16 year old kids, and letting them know that discipline does not just start when you get out there with whistle, discipline start, is going on forever. And what Ray was doing at the time, the kids were respecting them. Ray, Ray was getting the students to respect them as well as I was trying to get the students to respect myself. During our first years together, the number of athletes grew considerably, causing a major problem in the equipment storage, with the equipment storage and repairs. Ray, working very close to one of our coaches, Joe Almeida, decided to change and reorganize the equipment storage room area. All right, it, you know, it doesn't seem to be like much of what we're doing, but if you saw what we had compared to what we have today, a lot of the, the changes came about by Ray Robidoux. Um, he spent a lot of time, he designed it, and it helped out the players as well as the coaches. The equipment was always ready for players, whether it was during the week for practice or emergency fix-up, during the group game, Ray had it ready. Ray would go to away games or scrimmages on his own time. Like any good coach, Ray fell in love with the athletes. He was caring and understanding to all the athletes. When Ray's name came up for this recognition, not a coach nor a player, of the committee had a bad word on Ray. They all spoke very positive. They always remember that one time where he helped above and beyond his job. This award is just a small appreciation for our gratitude for all he did to the students at Boca Town. And now I'd like to introduce you to a former equipment manager, but a friend to all the coaches and to all the athletes at Boca Town, Mr. Ray Rubin. States a certificate of appreciation presented to Raymond Robidoux for outstanding and dedicated service to the athletic programs of the Beth Vocational, Greater New Bedford Regional Vocational Technical High School. Thank you. This is something I never expected, and I would like to thank the committee for even considering me. And I would like to give my thanks especially to Mr. Shea and all the coaches who always helped in every way they should. And without them, I could have never done my job. So I want to thank everybody. Thank you. Our next inductee, I 
I'm not going to say much more than you can see in here, and a gentleman who's going to sort of be the leader for his induction into the Hall of Fame will tell you more about him. He is a Hall of Famer without a doubt as an individual, and his background certainly shows that he deserves it for the purpose that we have here. Speaking to induct, Chuck Bacaricki is a gentleman, a scholar, every single one of these to the nth degree in his own right. Bird saw it. Bird, would you come up? Talk about Chester Bacaricki. We played the first basketball game. Al played, Al played in those days. 
And now, they closed it. Of course, we're typing on, so what's that, 50 years ago? <laughs> Never thought I'd live this long. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I think one of Chet's greatest highlights when they beat us, we won the state championship, went to the New England tournaments, they beat us. I got one point, and they nullified it because one of our arts over was in the lane. That was the worst day I ever had in all of my career. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun in those days. Of course, Chet was a tremendous baseball player. Chet had a tryout with the Boston Braves. He and Johnny my son went up there. And of course, I don't know whether they give him money to stay at a hotel or whatnot, but they stayed with my sister, Roxbury, West Roxbury. That's a few years ago, aren't you? <laughs> But we had a lot of fun down the trail. Not a better guy could be inducted in the Hall of Fame and check. Of course, we've seen the good side of life, we've seen the bad side of life. And of course, in a depression, sometimes it didn't eat too good either. Right. <laughs> but anyhow, Chuck played football, Chuck played basketball, and he played baseball. I remember talking to Chuck after I played with the Federal High School, I played football too. Come they played somebody up Lynn or somebody or some go up around Boston. Come home, he says, I don't feel for good. He says, some guy really hit me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, that's the way it goes. A little levity now. Mac used to coach both, I don't know, but well, these guys remember the old times, you know. Then it was Mac, Bill Norton, a few others. Ziggy and Yak came in later. But Chuck was flunking man. So he goes up, I don't know where to build or not, whoever taught Mac, Mac was up, he said, you got to pass up, Jesus Christ, look, we got a good team, you know. They won the 39 or 38, they won the championship, yeah. So he said, you got to pass them. So I forgot who the teacher was. He said, all right, Jen, I'll ask you one question. If you answer this, I'll pass you Mac. So he says, how much is two and two? Jen says, four. Mac says, give him another chance. <laughs> Gentlemen, and I can call him a young man. 
man, he's a heck of a lot younger than I am, that's for sure. Gets all his energy. I thought he was just hyped up last year because he was going into the Hall of Fame. I see him here tonight, and he's as bubbly as ever, and he's a year older. I don't understand it, but I guess it's youth for you. Gary Pope was inducted into the Hall of Fame last year, but right now he has the great honor of coming up here and being the spokesman for the induction of our next Hall of Fame member. For Mike Gomes, Gary, I'll give you two and a half seconds to get started. just as nervous as last year. Uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate all the inductees for entering the Hall of Fame this year. But uh, I also feel proud that Mike Golds asked me to speak on his behalf and induct him into the Hall of Fame. And first of all, I'd like to say that his lovely wife, Maria, his daughter, uh, his son, and his other son, Scott, who's not here, this uh, is a proud moment to see Michael inducted into the Hall of Fame. I've known Michael for 10 years. Sorry I can't be just as funny, but he's a tough guy to talk. Uh, and then I try to think about all week of uh, funny things to say about him. But it's very hard because Michael was never a funny guy. <laughs> Michael's very serious at everything he does. I made sure that I say nice things because I think Mike is still with me. <laughs> Not sure of that. I don't think. But anyway, I've known Mike ever since I was 10 years old. And we uh, grew up together playing sports, uh, basketball, uh, money playground. And uh, Mike was always a big guy, as you can see now. But Mike was very deceiving uh, by his opponents. Uh, uh, Myself, when I was growing up, because I said, I can, I can run around this guy easy. But Mike had ways of make, taking shortcuts. And every time he took a shortcut, he always he would beat you to the hoop, smack you on the head at the same time, and, <laughs> and, and just score upon you. And uh, he, he was just amazing. And when we went to high school, I ended up following Mike. Mike was a, a role model that I followed. And I think that's the only reason why I was able to play uh, the three sports at Vocational, because I had into both uh, in Mike's sophomore in Mike's sophomore year as a freshman. And um, during the summer months, Mike was going to football practice, and I, and I followed Mike to football practice. Luckily, I made the team and was able to, was able to start and play along with him in uh, football for three years. Um, I also played with him in basketball for three years, but we entered the tech turning. And Mike was a tackle. I was a quarterback. Mike, as a tackle, threw more tests on passes than me as a quarterback. <laughs> it's unbelievable, but he did. I just don't, I just don't know how he did it. This, this guy's so amazing that any, any sport he played in, he always achieved in, in beating his opponent. And I don't care who it was. I haven't played with a better person or known a better person in life than I do a play. So without further ado, because my legs are shaking up here. <laughs> it's hard to follow that last act. <laughs> so I would like to introduce Mike Holmes into the Hall of Fame. Uh, as a friend, as someone I, I, I always looked up to, and knowing that he and his family uh, are here, this is a proud moment for me to introduce Mike Gomes. I'd just like to thank uh, Mike Shea, uh, all the committee for holding me in. Uh, Gary for that inspiring speech. <laughs> My uncle Tony sitting over there, made his pep talks before every game. And most of all, I'd like to thank my family. Um, without them, I really wouldn't be here. Thank you.
We haven't set a rate yet as to what we're going to charge you. <laughs> we're having a committee meeting afterwards. At this point, I'd like to introduce a man who I met when I first moved back into the area and finally talked him into coaching a brand new uh, or a revival of an American Legion baseball team. And a bunch of rag tags, he took that baseball team and uh, much to the rest of the league's chagrin, they won everything that year. Won the zone title and uh, did a heck of a job. And they were wearing, this was 1978, 1970, no, it was 1980, I believe. They were wearing 1956 Fairhaven High School uniforms because they got them for a dollar. But that's the story of the baseball, former baseball coach here at New Bedford Book Tech, Doug Johnson, who's going to come up and uh, give homage to our next inductee, another well-deserved member coming into the New Bedford Book Tech Hall of Fame. And we're talking about Ray Richard. Doug Johnson, wherever you are, come on.
and uh, Francis Holt, although I only had him when he was in his 80s as a substitute teacher. He was trying to bang out lights upon us that were out. He said, I'll get these lights to work, and he'd be out there with his crutches hit the lights. I said, these things are going to fall and kill us, but uh, they didn't, and the lights began to work. These are leaders. <laughs> but I, I, I really want to thank everyone here, and again, I want to stress that um, this is an educational institution that is of great, great tradition, pride, leadership, and uh, I would like to really continue that and uh, hope we all work hard together to prove that uh, Vogue Tech is a very formidable institution as far as education is concerned, number one, and also athletics. And uh, I also want to thank everyone here, Mike Shea, Russ Baldwin, my other inductees, and uh, all of you folks for being here with us to uh, enjoy this very uh, nice ceremony. Thank you very much. Talking about people I knew and saying they were in their 80s. <laughs> people that deserve to be in this Hall of Fame, taking it all so calm and casually, just sitting here done. <laughs> Our next inductee is Adalbert Rosario. Al Rosario, and I have the distinct pleasure of talking about Al for just a moment or so. He attended New Bedford Vogue during the years of 1937 through 1941. He played football and he played basketball a member of the 1939 State Class C Championship football team, elected captain his senior year and was selected all Bristol County second team in 1940. What they don't tell you uh, in your program is that he was a captain for two years. Now, I'm not sure, but it could very well be that he was the first junior ever named captain of uh, a New Bedford Oak football team and maybe for any football team in the area. He was captain in uh, 1939 as a junior and also in 1940 as a senior. And it might be something to look into to see if a junior up to that time, and I don't know how many have been since, were named captains of their team. As a basketball player, Al was selected as captain during the 1940-41 season. A quote in the local Standard Times stated that Al Rosario was one of Boke's finest athletes in three decades. He's semi-retired now, working as a bail commissioner covering New Bedford, Fairhaven, Dartmouth, and the Cushioned area. He's married to Anna Rosario. They have four children. Phyllis Rosario Gomes, Al Rosario, Al J. Rosario, Norman J. Belay, and Maria Rosario. And the 1939-1940 football team became the state champs at the end of the season. And this was the season that Mr. McIntosh and Mr. Jeniak came up with the idea of a mystery back. The mystery back was actually a lineman who played guard, and the play was called 4X. Do I have to tell you any more? I'd like to welcome to the Deventer Folk Tech Hall of Fame, Mr. 4X himself, because he was the man who ran the play, Al Rosario.
I said, too bad they didn't keep the old school and have the kids go there for their freshman year, and then the next three years go to the new school. Then they could really appreciate what they had getting. I was, I was serious when I said that. I should have thought about I should have thought about this about 20 years ago because <clears throat> I was on the uh, vocational education advisory council for the state for 10 years, and that didn't do me much good because I didn't think about it. <laughs> I think that's a hell of an idea yeah. that these kids would go to the old school for one year and they would appreciate what they get at this new school. Right. If any of you people haven't been there, you should go there. It is really something. It lacks nothing. It lacks nothing. Everything is there. And I think that I am proud that I'm a product of the old school <laughs> that brought in the new school. By that, thank you very, very much. Tell you something else that might not be a bad idea, and we alluded to this. Our next uh, inductee uh, and I were talking, delightful conversation. Uh, we talked about music, we have the same interests and everything else. Uh, we didn't even realize that we had a slight delay waiting for the program to start. But at any rate, we were talking about something very similar that you just brought up that the people that are in this Hall of Fame right now. It is something that the younger people, too bad they didn't have it years ago when you people were playing, that you could look up to the people that had been inducted prior to you, which is what should is happening now, that there are students at the school today or in grammar school that will come into the school and see what your accomplishments were. And they might know of you or know someone you know or be a relative. They have something to shoot for. So you people are still role models in this day and age, and maybe it would be a good idea to take the 50 that are already in and the people tonight and bring them around to the eighth grade schools and the freshman classes at both and say, this is what people who attended this school have accomplished, yeah. and let them see them. Yeah. See them. So after paraphrasing what Barbara Stevens and I were talking about, I think we'll forget about her. No, we'll move on. <laughs> A delightful, delightful young lady, and I have to call her that because she's younger than I am. Dick Manning's going to tell you more about our next Hall of Fame inductee, Barbara Stevens is her name. Dick Manning is his. Dick, come on up here. Also a Hall of Fame member. He was inducted in 1989. Thank you, Wes. Congratulations to all the inductees. It is my pleasure and honor to present the following outstanding athlete and person for her induction into the Benton Boat Folk and Hall of Fame. I thank Barbara for asking me to present her. Barbara Stevens entered the Benton Boat in 1951 and was quickly recognized by Hall of Fame coach Leonora Louise as an outstanding athlete. Barbara participated in every athletic program available to girls in the 50s. She excelled at all of them. She played volleyball four years, softball, badminton, and basketball. She was the doubles champion of badminton. She was a singles champion in badminton. She had close to 400 average in softball. She was captain of the 1954 basketball team and in 1955 on the undefeated 17 and Ho, Narragansett League champions, she led the team in assists. But basketball was her game. There was no question. Anyone that knew her, that was her game. A style, she played a style unfamiliar to most people that watched girls basketball in those days. But in watching girls basketball, in the 50s, and I'm not sure when the rule went out, they could only bounce the ball two times. You had to know why she could dribble either hand, shoot hook shots, lefties, one hand set shots. She was ahead of her time, way ahead of her time. When I watched the high school today in college basketball, Barbara and her Hall of Fame teammate, who they played together, Gloria Pell, could have played on the teams today. I, I played uh, high school uh, sports myself, and after practice, on many occasions, even the Hammond Auditorium, uh, myself and Colin Jackson, and sometimes Bob Sylvia, would be coming down Hillman Street, and would see 
bar or practice in a little playground opposite the main office. And we would go over. And you remember the old game, shoot eggs? We would shoot eggs with her. Pretty soon she'd start dribbling either hand, and I would start dribbling with her. In fact, she came up with a nickname for me and called me Tricky Dicky. <laughs> and we go to the bat boys basketball games, so all of that at me from the second uh, the balcony of the Hamlin Auditorium. What became obvious to Colin Jackson, myself, and anyone else who saw her, she could have been our teammate. She just knew how to play basketball. She was known by her teammates, and anyone that watched her as an unselfish team player. She led the team in assists most years. She could score, but Gloria Fell really was the big scorer, and Barbara made sure that Gloria got the ball. And that's what made Barbara an outstanding player. And I, I've known her for years. I graduated with her. Uh, my wife was a guy on the basketball team with her. And I, I did make, make a point to go to practice, the girls' practice, whenever I could, and the girls' games, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> She was a joy to watch play basketball and a joy to, to know as a person. It's my honor to and welcome into the Hall of Fame Barbara Stevens. Thank you, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here this evening. And I thank the committee who worked so hard at arranging all of this. And I'm sore throat from nervousness. So, if you like my face. <laughs> what do you know? Here it is. 38 years and 14,000 days later. All this time. And it's really gratifying to see how things can change. It is truly an honor to be standing up here as your choice for the New Bedford Vocational Technical High School Hall of Fame. In a way, this evening is long overdue. For years, the Hall of Fame was like a treehouse with a sign on the door saying, Boys Club, keep out, this means you. <laughs> Club too, but it was that also, dear, you recall. So as the third woman and the second student of color to be elected to the Hall of Fame, I commend the school. I commend the board. I commend you all for doing the right thing. It's going to make a big difference to all the young girls going to this school now and later to look at the lineup and know that regardless of what they look like or where their families came from, that they have a chance to do well here and to be recognized and to inspire others. I was here last year when this group inducted its first black female member, indeed the first woman of color to make it. That was my best friend, Gloria Pell. And as some of you probably recall, Gloria and I were a dynamic duo on the basketball court. I always knew where she was, she knew where I was, and nobody got anything between us or past us. And that's still true today. We're really good friends. She couldn't make it tonight, but I know she's here with us in spirit, as all of your teammates know. Now, <clears throat> both of us have to acknowledge that we owe a lot to our remarkable gym teacher. Miss Lenore Louise, who sits right over there. The first woman to receive your award. She was a great teacher. She always told me, Barbara, you can do better. She didn't mean we weren't good enough. Hey, we knew we were good. You know what I mean? She just inspired us to improve our game just as all the teachers who came to our games and encouraged us to stretch ourselves, to do more via their support. We really hated those ugly uniforms, Lenore, but we loved the game. We didn't care what it was. Whatever it was, you name it. I was out there running around like a 
mad woman. Yeah, I know you guys are sitting there saying, don't kid yourself, you haven't got a waistline either. But I can still run most of you guys off the court. <laughs> and uh, as Irma Blomberg might say, you guys only can take up jogging now so you can hear heavy breathing again. <laughs> As you probably know, I went on to teach this ed, so I know how sports can enrich our lives. We were learning to be fair with each other, and life as in on the court. A good teacher like Miss Louise really leads her students to the threshold of their own minds. Anyhow, I've had a lot of fun in these 14,000 days after graduation, and I've even had my share of celebrity life. I've been a radio DJ, I've done at least 10 or more theater productions. I've run for public office and almost won. I'm still doing fundraising. I work at a, as a clerk in a small town. The whole town knows you, and no matter how you feel, you gotta keep smiling because the game must go on. In closing, I would like to thank Claudia and Dick Manning for their fortitude and faith in my making it here tonight. It's really quite an accolade. Being made immortal in my own hometown, only 14,000 days later. Thank you very much.
And we took him down to, he was on the little guy at this time, we took him down to Brooklyn Island Park, I'll never forget it. Put some skates on him, and so go ahead and skate. And my wife and I, we were sitting on the bank over there, and he'd be going one way, and we'd, we'd stop to look down here, and all of a sudden he's going back this way. Talk about skating, it was unbelievable. How he ever could develop into the skating that he did once he got into high school. And he, he played defense for Vogue that year. And after the year, he led it, as a matter of fact, and after the year was over, he came home and he said, I'm not playing hockey anymore. I said, what do you mean? You're not, you know, you're, you're a freshman. You had three more years to play hockey. You didn't want to play hockey anymore. And that was the year that we were having a lot of trouble with fighting and everything else in the hockey game. He just didn't want to play anymore. So the next year, he went out for basketball. And I said, well, you know, you're going to have to start on the JV team. No, I'm not, he says. I'm going to play varsity. OK. So sure enough, he did. He played varsity that first year. And in his second and third year, he was a Standard Times All-Star, 1976, 77, 77, and 78. And he was the winner of the Rusty Ramos Memorial Trophy. They had a couple of good years. They went almost all the way to the finals. I think they got beaten uh, against Wayham. Next came baseball, and he led it three years in baseball. He was a Standard Times All-Star, 1977 and 78. He entered the electrical department at Vogue and continued on after that. And right now, his electric background, or electrical, I should say, took him to Sylvania Tech, where he became a computer technician. So right now, he works for Siemens Company, a field service technician. I'd like to introduce you to my son and inductee in the Hall of Fame, Dana Warren. First, I'd like to thank Mike Shea and the committee for this outstanding night. It's really such an honor to be up here with some real fine athletes. I'd also like to thank my mother and father for just giving me the opportunity to have a great uh, high school career and have a great place to grow up and start good roots to have a nice family and just do really good. So I'd just like to thank everybody for coming tonight and thank you very much. doesn't belong into the place they were inducted tonight. Let's have a big hand. I know there's a lot more socializing to go on here tonight, and uh, well-deserved, because you have the past and the present, and looking along at a couple, maybe a couple of future Hall of Famers sitting out here tonight. Right there, they look like they could get up there one day. Congratulations to all of you from the committee, from the school, from those that are all in. It's a great honor. You've earned it. You've deserved it. Enjoy the rest of your evening, people. Hope you've enjoyed the evening so far. I can guarantee you, if you'll play the music you want to hear, might not be what I want to hear, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Freitas and Sam's Giant Jukebox, congratulations to you people again. Have a good one, people. Thank you for coming. Good night. Thank you, Russ. Nice round of applause for Russ Baldwin, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we do want to invite you to stick around a little bit. we got some music. We'll take all your requests for you. But I know Russ has to get up at 3.30 in the morning to get back to the newsstand at WNBA. This video was produced by In-House Productions. The camera guy. Henry Fortune. Good show lined up tonight. The Southeastern Massachusetts Baseball League wrapped it up, and our cameras were there capturing all the action. Mm -hmm. We've got it next. Stay with us. Well, as we find out tonight, it's not whether you win or lose, it's whether you come back next year. Hopefully someone will come back next year, okay. uh, the way things are going, but I'm optimistic. You know, they had some uh, problems earlier on in the year, but 
I think they solved them a little bit and learned from the mistakes. Let's hope that uh, it'll work out next year. The first year of the Southeastern Mass Baseball League is history. Yes, the ups and downs. I think it's safe to say that it did end up on an upswing, though. True, they had to cut the season short, but the championship series went to the fifth in the siding game. Our own Donna Fendrick was there Friday night. Can a team who finishes in last place in the regular season beat the team who finished first during regular season play in the final series of any league? I mean, seriously. Well, anyone can beat anyone in a short series. The team with the most chemistry usually comes out on top. So the case with the White Sox and the Indians in the Southeastern Massachusetts Baseball Association title series. On Friday, the final game. With the best of five series tied up at two games apiece, Digger Frakes on the hill for the White Sox, Kyle Kubiak on the hill for the Indians through five. The result, an Indian shutout. An Indian triumph over the expected first place White Sox three zip. An example of how parity, despite standings is normally evident in short series events. Well, this SMBA final was more than just a final. See, the real story, it was rumored this would be the first and only final this league would ever see. The league is a rebirth of the old Twilight League in New Bedford some 25 years ago. What was supposed to be a six-team league ended up only a five-team league. The president, Les Bono, resigned midway through, and funds were diminishing. Well, what was expected this year, each team in the SMBA would play a 24-game season. What was not expected, the season would be cut short four games due to lack of funds. So the playoffs began early, and as expected, a championship team was crowned. The question, however, what is the status of the SMBA heading into 1994? We held a meeting at uh, the 6th Bristol on the 18th of July, and some people came forward with some financial assistance, and uh, we've, got, we've had some good ideas, some good input from some of the managers, so, from some of the, the, the people that were there that wanted to get involved. We've, got, we've expanded our board of directors from five to seven, and uh, the league's going to survive. Well, I think next year we're going to get uh, maybe Channel 13, some of the radio stations involved, and more people within the community involved. Now that we've got a year under our belts and people have seen uh, what it's like, I think we're going to just go along and do that. So following its inception year, it would seem fitting the league with so many uncertainties should provide us with a champion who was everything but the expected. The Indians, the champs of 93. The league, the real champs of 94. Myself, it was great to get a chance to be a part of a real winning team. I got pumped up. I wanted to do it for Kubiak and for the guys that weren't able to be here tonight. And uh, this team's come a long way from the beginning of the season. And we just put it all together, that's all that matters. Reporting from Paul Walsh Field in New Bedford, I'm Donna Fendrick for News Center 13 Sports. Twilight League had some setup problems last year, including a shortfall of money, but you're telling me this year they are back, huh? Anytime you start out brand new, of course, you gotta work out hmm. some of the kinks. They actually had to cut their season short last year, oh. but this year they're cruising. Good. They're in high gear. And that's good for us. This summer marks year number two of the SMBA Twilight League. Plagued by financial restraints in its inaugural season, we find the league alive and well in year number two. A stop in New Bedford's Walsh Field last night featured the Indians and Marlins battling it out. Let's pick up the action with a rather strange end of the second inning. The Indians' Mike Santos strikes out, but look at Kyle Kupiak coming in to steal home. Looks exciting, but turns out to be meaningless. Third inning now, Marlins pick up a run on this Dave D'Souza liner pass third. This gives the Marlins a 3-1 lead. And you'd never know it from Fido's reaction, but things are about to heat up. Bottom of the third, Indians on the comeback with Kupiak on third. Chad Williams serves the single to right. Next batter, Mike Santos follows suit, looping it into right. Game tied at three. Two outs, the bases are juiced for Gary Sharp. And Sharp will hit it sharply. Takes it all the way to the fence. The line shot clears the bases. Indians have the lead at 6-1. Sharp winds up all the way on second. Then a bizarre play. The liner right at umpire lefty Duvall. He says it hit him in the arm, and it's a dead ball. Fast footwork by lefty. He's okay. After all, it hit him in the right arm. You know, he's lefty. Game goes on in the fifth. It's John Casey with the blast to left, putting runners on second and third. This would set up another Indians run. A late Marlins comeback would come up short. It's the Indians holding on for the 8-7 win.
We enjoyed it. We had three losses prior to this, so we needed to get back on a winning track to try to stay up top because if they would have won, they would have been in first place. If we win, we're in first place. So with that, we'd like to stay up on top of them anyways. Tell me about this league a little bit. It's my first time I've had made the trip here and had a chance to see it. It looks like it's a lot of fun. I mean, not a great deal of pressure, and the guys seem to be enjoying it. The old Twilight League went out in the 60s, and it was something that was brought back. And now that it's here, we'd like to keep it here and uh, let the public know about it and get some input and have some people, more people come to the games and enjoy it. It's fun. It's a nice night out for a family who wants to come and see baseball again, uh, you know, and at night because there's not a lot of baseball at night. Glad to see that, you know, Lefty can still give that strike call with the right arm there. <laughs> so the Indians are in first place and things are cooking this year in the SMBA, and that's good news. This video was edited by... Sean's Vision Studios.